Hey, check this out. I want to show you something over here. I just got this in the mail and I'm super excited about it. Have you ever seen one of these before? You know what that is? You can see it's it's round. It's got a got a hole in the middle of it. Got these funky little characters on it. Most people today have never seen one of these, but back in the Bronze Age, these things were everywhere. Thousands, literally thousands of these have been found in archeological sites around ancient Mesopotamia. Um, this is a replica. It's not a real thing. I'm not that much of a big shot. They're called cylinder seals. Cylinder because it's a cylinder, as you can see, and seals because these funky little characters right here, that was somebody's signature. They use this to sign off on official transactions, documents, military orders, that kind of thing. This was how people identified who they were in documents. This was equal parts ID, stamp, signature, and jewelry. Because in the earliest days of civilization, long before papyrus scrolls, records were kept with clay tablets, information punched into it in cuneiform. And they would sign those records with this by rolling it across the clay and leaving an imprint of their seal. Today we have digital encryption and two-factor authentication. Back then, they had this. It's a fascinating bit of history. It's a relic of a time long past, but today I've got one and I've got some clay. Let's take this thing for a spin, shall we? Signed by me. Huh. Issues of personal identity and authentication are kind of a hot topic right now. What with all of us being online, data breaches, scammers, spammers, and, you know, all those lovely people that make living in the 2020s, just great. But this is not just a 2020s problem. Issues of identity theft, intellectual property theft, these go all the way back. Take this logo, for example. If you see this logo, it means it's an official document from the United States Publishing Office, or the GPO. It's a federal agency that prints and distributes official documents, and they can trace its roots all the way back to Benjamin Franklin. Way back then, 250 years ago, it was important to be able to prove that a document was actually from the GPO, and that seal is the best way they had to do that. So they still do it to this day. Of course, it's evolved since then. If you open a PDF from them electronically, like Adobe Reader will show a blue ribbon on a signed certified PDF to kind of show that it's certified. Um, there's not Adobe tools, obviously. Clearly, authenticity is important to the government. I mean, how else would the public have complete and total trust in everything they say? <laughs> But authenticity matters to regular people too. I mean, look, whether or not you're pro or against cryptocurrencies and NFTs and that kind of thing, the major problem they're trying to fix is authentication through a distributed ledger. Authentication issues are one of the main concerns around quantum computing because it's thought that quantum computers could be able to crack any kind of encryption. In fact, this past August, Google actually took some steps to try to um, prevent that from happening in the future. They released an open source security key algorithm that supposedly will be safe from quantum computer hacking. So yeah, the battle for authentication is ongoing and uh, it probably will be for um, ever. For, forever. In a sense, you could make the argument that the entire history of civilization is kind of a authentication arms race. Yeah, down through the years, governments and institutions have come up with all kinds of clever authentication schemes. And all along, there have been bad actors trying to find clever ways to exploit those weaknesses. Yeah, forgery has been a major social problem since at least the first century BCE, and we know that because the Roman Empire passed a law against it. Actually, a surprising number of surviving ancient texts are just tax forms. <laughs> I mean, taxes suck, but you know, we've, we've learned a lot about ancient civilizations because of it. Death and taxes, am I right? But those tax forms were super important back in their time and obviously subject to forgery, so a clever trick that they employed to prevent that was signet rings. A signet was a small seal, a stamp basically, usually with a family crest or a personal design, and for the sake of convenience, they were often put on rings. Some ancient Egyptians used signet rings. They worked well with clay tablets. You just imprint the seal into the clay, but later they'd be used with wax on documents or sometimes just stamped on ink like a rubber stamp today. So they remained useful for a long time, all the way up through the Middle Ages. Signet rings are more of a fashion thing these days, but once upon a time, they were the cutting edge of authentication technology. But before the rings, especially in ancient Sumerian and Mesopotamian cultures, you had cylinder seals. Cylinder seals were carved from stone with a hollow center so a king, scribe, or whatever could wear it on a necklace or maybe pinned to their clothing. That way it was always on them and if they needed to use them, had to sign for something, they'd just roll it on the clay. But they may have had a little roller pin tool that they could have put in it, kind of like a paint roller. 
They've been found all over, but they were especially popular in ancient Mesopotamia, which is the region around the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, now mostly modern day Iraq. Now, one advantage of cylinder seals over, say, the signet rings was just the amount of space they could provide. A signet ring can only stamp, what, a few centimeters at most, but a rolling cylinder seal gave you multiple times more space. It was a pretty cool 3D solution. Instead of carrying a giant stamp around, you could just roll it out. Which kind of makes me wonder, is, is it always been a thing to make your name the biggest name on a document, you know, like, like the whole John Hancock thing? By the way, more space means more room for detail, and they took advantage of it. Some of these things get crazy. Like here are some from the Spurlock Museum at the University of Illinois. Examples from the Metropolitan Museum in New York show the wide variety of materials used to make cylinder seals. Limestone or even carved shell could be used, but there were even seals made from semi-precious stones. Like this translucent Chalcedony seal with a winged horse design is awesome. It's one of my favorites. So just to give you an idea of what this is supposed to look like, um, I ordered this from a person on Etsy. They sent this little uh, sample thing along with it. So I'll put this right here and you can see what it's supposed to look like. Now I can tell you right now from playing with it, um, it's, <laughs> it's not quite as deep as what this looks like. I also noticed a small problem, which is that these little indentions, meet me over here, these little indentions get filled up with the clay, at least the clay that I have, it gets filled up with. So what I have to do in between these is go, I got a little toothbrush over there, so I'm cleaning these off as I go. Okay, so I'm gonna start with this one because I've used this one before and I should point out, I really don't know what I'm doing here. Highlighter I can use to flatten it out. I feel like I'm baking a cookie or something. I'll try it once just using my fingers and then once with my little makeshift tool here. So you can you can kind of see the design. It's not great. Let's flip it over and try it with the tool. That's better. Okay, that definitely works better. They definitely used some kind of tool back in the day when they used this. That was a thousand times better. Now, considering how detailed these things could be and how important they were to Mesopotamian society, the, the makers of these seals became very important people. Like, it took a lot of skill to make designs into these things that would actually make impressions that work like this one. I mean, in addition to the, you know, artistic challenge, all the readable elements, the letters and the numbers, they all had to be carved backwards. This would kind of be like copying a photograph by engraving the negative. I mean, not to mention these seal makers would have been entrusted with people's very identities. They had to be somebody with a lot of integrity, you know, somebody who wouldn't forge things and fake them for money. And yet thousands of cylinder seals have been found. Um, estimates suggest that there may be hundreds of thousands that are still buried out there. So it wasn't just the rich and privileged that had these. They must have been fairly ubiquitous. So clearly ancient seal cutters were in high demand. But it seems like the nature of that demand changed over time because cylinder seals kind of went from a practical tool to a status symbol. And the methods and materials that were used to make them changed as well. Early examples were almost exclusively made of soft stone that were, you know, easier to carve but maybe rougher to handle. Uh, these were mostly found in the Uruk and Jemdet Nasser periods of Mesopotamian history. But later examples from the period starting about 4,000 years ago were almost exclusively made out of smoother, more visually appealing hard stone. And various decorations started showing up on the seals as well, like ornamental caps and other flourishes, so they had clearly become Mesopotamian bling at that point. There's also one archaeological site where several seals were found that had apparently never been rolled. Um, at least, none of the impressions from those seals were ever found. Which seems like a shame, you know, given how sophisticated the seal impressions could be, because, you know, some of them indicated that they were unique to a specific family. Some showed not only who participated in a transaction, but what was actually traded, like where it came from and how it was supposed to be used. Like, I guess if you're somebody that does a, a type of transaction regularly, you would get a seal made specifically for that transaction because you were doing it all the time. Cylinder seals finally fell out of fashion sometime after 1000 BCE when papyrus took over as a material of choice for official documents. This is way before it became the avatar font. I know what you did! Which is actually kind of funny when you think about it, because you would think that maybe a clay tablet with a unique seal impression would be harder to fake than just, you know, ink on a page. And I'm sure there were arguments like that when people were switching over, like a bunch of old people complaining about how things were better back in the old days with clay tablets. I mean, like, think about just how resistant people are to new technology today. They've been using these for 3,000 years. Now, I mentioned briefly earlier that cylinder seals have been found 
all over. And it's true, um, Egypt had their own tradition of cylinder seals that were different from those in Mesopotamia. Of course, they're fairly close by, so they probably got it from their neighbors to the north and made it their own. But far more interesting is that cylinder seals have been found in Mesoamerica. One is the San Andres cylinder that clearly shows a bird in an Olmec name, Three Ajaw. Uh, the Wikipedia caption for this picture says that the bird is possibly speaking the name. Is it just me or does Three Ajaw sound like the name of a Mesoamerican rapper? <laughs> Maybe this was an ad for a show. Now, experts seem to believe that the Mesoamerican cylinder seals were used to mark cloth, not clay, but the Olmec and Mesopotamian artifacts are similar. I'm not saying those two civilizations had contact 2,700 years ago, but I'm not not saying it. <laughs> but really, though, that just might be a case of parallel thinking, because if there is a point to this video, it's that the issue of authentication is universal. So whether they use the cylinder seals or not, they had a way of dealing with authentication in ancient Mesoamerica. And again, you could say that that's what cryptocurrency is all about, uh, or it's what it's supposed to be all about anyway. That's how we deal with authentication today. So, you know, regardless of what you think of crypto as an asset, the whole technology of blockchains and distributed ledgers is clearly just the next thing in a struggle that has gone back since the beginning of recorded history. And when I talk about distributed ledgers and blockchains and whatnot, and you don't really know what I mean by all that, you might want to check out the cryptocurrency course on Brilliant, who is kindly sponsoring this episode, much obliged. The cryptocurrency class starts with a brief history of currency throughout the ages, where you get a baseline of how currencies work and what problems they have, and then how cryptocurrencies solve those problems, getting into hash functions, the blockchain ledger, proof of work, and even smart contracts. And if all that feels a little high level to you to start off with, you can back up and start with a computer science and programming path that'll start you at the basics of computers and you work your way forward all the way to neural networks and quantum computers. If you haven't tried Brilliant, it's kind of like playing games or doing daily puzzles every day that can help you to learn things by solving problems. And that kind of hacks your brain's natural pattern recognition and, and you remember things better because you learned it in a way that makes sense to you. It's just a different kind of learning than what you're used to. In fact, I find it especially fun to kind of go back and look at subjects that maybe you struggle with in school because often light bulbs will come on that in your brain that never did before because the puzzles are all very interactive and they're graphics heavy in ways that you probably didn't have when you were a kid. See, it wasn't your fault. You were just learning the wrong way. And if you'd like to try this new way of learning, you can get 30 days for free when you sign up at brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. And the first 200 people to sign up will get 20% off the annual subscription. But seriously, they've got an app. You can download the puzzles to your phone. So even when you're offline, you can check in once a day and, and just make it a habit, you know, just a few minutes a day when you're bored and you'll be amazed at what you learn. Anyway, again, it's brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. Links down below. All right, big thanks to the Answer Files on Patreon and the channel members who help keep this thing going, whether supporting with their money and, and just becoming an awesome community. I can't say too many good things about you guys, but we've got some new members to shout out. We've got Jacques Body, uh, Crunch de Grace Hopper, Nori Niven. Nori Niven! I know Nori. Thanks for doing that, buddy. Uh, Pro Insight, AMB, Roger Ramjet, Shireen Sills, Bruce Buzalski, uh, Lorenzo Cruz, and Hissy Fit Pet Therapy and Rescue. Thank you guys so much. And if you'd like to join them, you can get early access to videos, access to exclusive live streams and more cool stuff. You also get a little cool, you know, button by your name that makes you stand out in the crowd in the comments. Uh, just hit the little join button down below. Thanks again for watching. If this is your first time watching this, um, maybe check out this video. Uh, maybe I'll put the one for Kipu's up. That was last week's video that was about like this ancient code that the Incans had uh, where they did it on string. I actually made one. It's right here. You can see it, how it works in the old video. Or you can look at any of the others that are down the side if you're watching on your web browser. Uh, give them a click. And if you enjoy any of those videos, I invite you to subscribe. I do come back with videos every Monday. But that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe and... As I always say, I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.